morning. I will call the March 16, 2022 regular meeting to order. I ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. Supervisor Anderson. Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Supervisor Desmond. Here. Vice Chair Vargas. Vargas here. Chair Fletcher. Fletcher here. First on the agenda is non agendized public communication, an opportunity for the public to address the board on matters that are within our jurisdiction but not on today's agenda. The only action we may take is a referral to the Chief Administrative Officer. Reminder, according to Rule 4A, members of the public that are non-English speaking and need interpretation assistance will be allotted extra time for translation. Pursuant to the rules of procedure, we will have a maximum of 10 public speakers. Uh, the remaining non-agendized public speakers will be heard at the conclusion of our agenda. I'll ask the clerk to call forward up to 10 speakers. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have 15 total requests to speak on matters not listed on the agenda, one in person and 14 by phone. For those that have requested to speak via phone, if you could please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We will begin with the in-person speakers. As your name is called, if you could please come forward and stand against the east wall under the murals until it is your turn to speak. You'll then have two minutes to address the board. And I'd like to invite forward the following individual, Dean Spooner. And if you could please state your name before beginning your comments. Good morning. I'm here because I'm very frustrated with government in general. Um, I have a handicapped daughter. She's 51 years old, uh, severely handicapped. So uh, we've waited 13 years to get Section 8. Um, we got it last year. Um, so it's the first time filling out all the paperwork. Um, I've communicated with her caseworker uh, 37 times and never got a return call because of COVID, nobody's at the office. So um, we have to fill out a form that goes in um, to keep her Section 8. And I filed it uh, a day late. It was due on the 28th of January and I put it in on, I mean on the 27th, I put it on the 28th. Anyway, you go up to the office uh, and there's a security guard and he points to the Dropbox and okay, throw it in the Dropbox, um, camera. Um, put it in. When I got back, I called again. Will somebody reaffirm that you accept it? Because the old way, you'd bring in your paperwork and there'd be a clerk and she would stamp the copy received and you'd go home. Um, a week and a half ago, we got a letter saying um, Section 8, we're terminated. Now, that really gets everybody upset. So I called every county board of supervisors. I finally got two to return a call. One, the answering machine was full and hung up. So you guys need to get your offices up and responsible to your citizens you serve. And uh, anyway, so I need you to, and next thing, San Diego Gas and Electric. You have to get them to open an office to deal with problems. You call them, you gotta wait an hour on hold or two days they'll call you back and they can't do anything. So that's my, I don't have enough time to talk about everything else. Hey, sir, if you hang out right there in the front row, there's someone on their way who can help you work through some of your issues. Okay. Thank you. I can't help you with sdg and &E, but we can help you with the other stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Now we will hear from those that have requested to speak by phone. When it is your turn to speak, you'll be unmuted and you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. And I'd like to remind the callers that they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. We will, we will begin with our first caller. Again, if you could please state your name before beginning your comments. Hi, this is KB Strange. I'm a pharmacist practicing in unincorporated North County. And last fall, I described for the Board of Supervisors a new pharmaceutical program from the San Diego County Marijuana Prevention Initiative in partnership with pharmacies throughout the East County, both in cities and in un unincorporated regions. Every day in San Diego County, about three dozen people show up at local hospital emergency rooms for several reasons related to cannabis use a common one being drug interactions. This program is aimed at raising awareness and providing consumers with information on how cannabis interacts with medications. Since the program was launched about six months ago, more than 10,000 information cards in English and 2,000 in Spanish have been distributed as an attachment to prescription medications at 17 pharmacies countywide. 
The preliminary surveys show that support show support for this type of public information and health information by about 90% of patients. What the emergency departments see most commonly is a drug interaction of over-sedation caused by the additive effect of marijuana with pain medication, anxiety medicine, antidepressants, or sleeping pills. Many of the patients who have complex medical or complex mental health conditions are often not aware of the drug interactions that exist between their prescribed medications and marijuana that they are self-medicating with. Marijuana can be harmful. You can ask the three dozen people every day who show up at hospital emergency rooms. Legalizing something harmful never removes the harm. It just changes the legal consequences, usually for those who promote, produce, or in other ways profit financially from the legalized substance with little or no regard for the negative impact on individuals or our society at large. Thank you for listening. Thank you. We'll go to the next caller. <clears throat> Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Mark Wilcox. As a grandfather and father, I watched over our family the last two years, encouraging them to stay fit and avoid activities like smoking and vaping that could weaken their lungs and to avoid secondhand smoke and vapor. Thank you, board members, for adopting a flavored tobacco ban here in the county's unincorporated regions that we all hope reduced e-cigarette and tobacco use in this county as it has in other cities and counties. It was just over four years ago that the issue of adulterants in vape products, tobacco, and marijuana was big news. From the East Coast this week has come a new notice regarding the recall of over 500 electronic vaping products containing substances not suitable for inhalation. Although some states put bans on the use of vitamin E acetate, squalene, and squalane, and other related substances in electronic vaping products, California was not one of those. I believe in the power of public health policies that have at their center protecting youth. It is especially important to parents, grandparents, and caring adults that our youth also do not seek smoking and vaping as a source of dealing with stress and anxiety. Better physical and mental health could be achieved through a flavored electronic marijuana product ban adopted by this Board of Supervisors. What a statement of love and concern for young people would be such a ban in our county. Thank you. Thank you. We will go to our next caller. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. This is Ann Riddle. I'd like to respond to the listening session that was held on March 9th, Wednesday, March 9th, uh, regarding, I think, what must be the new consultants to help the county with social equity policies regarding marijuana businesses. What, <laughs> what was of concern to us who were listening is that it came in two parts, a Zoom meeting and in person. They were held simultaneously. Of course, they unfortunately were late getting started by about 20 minutes, and the Latino parents who were sitting with me gave up. But what we noticed is the in-person meeting was held in the city of San Diego and not in the unincorporated area. So perhaps going forward, that might be something to consider, actually move it to the unincorporated area where, mar where your policies around marijuana businesses are actually going to be located. And the other thing that parents were really concerned about is they were calling their effort justice in the 420 industry. And 420 is jargon that our teens use regarding marijuana, and it's not used in a positive way. It's as in let's gather and smoke out. And so I don't know if that's the best language to use for a social equity issue. The other thing I noticed is that people were thrilled with the idea of reparations that the county was considering. 
But they weren't really interested in the pot shop in their neighborhoods that are already saturated with liquor stores and tobacco stores. But they did mention that what they would like is transition programs to help their young people make the leap from high school to work or to college. And how, if they had really good community centers, this could be the location where these transition programs would be held. I thank you for this opportunity to participate in this upcoming, uh, in the past listening session, and I hope that in the future they'll be located in the unincorporated areas. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Um, good morning, Barbara Gordon. As a public health educator, I am increasingly concerned with the long-term public health effects of marijuana use, especially as the county looks to permit more marijuana businesses. I wanted to share with you a newly formed medical group called ISIC. It's the International Academy on Science and Impact of Cannabis. It is an organization of doctors who educate on marijuana based on scientific and medical literature. I think it is a nonpartisan, nonpolitical group. Their scientific research provides accurate and honest information recognizing the use of marijuana as potentially harmful. I urge um, the Board of Supervisors to visit their website, isic1.org, for the thousands of peer-reviewed medical articles on the harms and long-term consequences of cannabis and marijuana. Public health effects of commercial marijuana on communities needs to be considered. The growing Im negative impacts continue to strain our health care and addiction treatment resources. These impacts will far surpass any tax revenue the county would receive. Tobacco years ago was promoted as harmless before smoking was linked to all kinds of cancers. The opiate industry marketed its drugs as non-addictive and safe, and, and we are still dealing with that crisis. Let's learn from our mistakes and not repeat them with marijuana. We need public health policies that follow the science, prevent addiction, and decrease mental illness. Do not support a predatory industry that addicts its customers. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Becky Rapp. I'm a parent and I'm deeply concerned with the mental health crisis we're facing with our youth. Teens and young adults all over the county, from North County to South County, are suffering more than ever with depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideology. The numbers are staggering. It's so concerning that state senators are talking about it and engaging in conversations with the U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy. Senator Lankford spoke to the impacts of marijuana consumption and how it ties to mental health in youth issuing an advisory and call to action. The Surgeon General states, quote, marijuana works by binding to receptors in the brain to produce euphoria, intoxication, and memory and motor impairments. Dr. Murphy goes on to say, when it comes to youth, I worry that there is a perception that marijuana is utterly harmless to children. We need to be responsible in how we teach our kids about marijuana. Families, Healthcare providers and teachers need to know how to talk to children, end quote. Senator Langford recognizes that this message is not getting out. Children and youth are watching role models use marijuana. They're seeing businesses open with signage and advertising targeting kids. Billboards around San Diego advertise the misconception that marijuana will make you healthy and happy. We even have businesses with the name of cookies in it. These are located in La Mesa, Sereno Valley, and Mission Valley. It's crucial we now more than ever educate our youth, educate them on the detrimental effects that marijuana can have on their mental health. Small steps such as removing billboards in and around communities and limiting the number of businesses that can locate in any given area. Planning groups need to have a voice. 
when locating these businesses in and around their communities. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to the next caller. Audra, so yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, you know, I mean, children are not suffering from those things because of marijuana, it's because of the policies and all these mandates and the fact that they have had their lives turned upside down. Um, and it's quite interesting as well that Tara isn't there because I know she loves Agenda 2030, so I'm surprised that she's not there. Um, and I hope that you really think about who you are going to implement for sheriff because this could be super devastating for the entire county as it already has been. And I do like Fletcher, uh, Nathan, that you um, helped Mr. Spooner. I was actually surprised because when I first uh, came in and met you, I thought they're going to listen to us. They're going to hear that we are concerned about people's lives and they're actually going to do something because you can. So to see you do that for that man, I, I think is really great. I just wish that you would spread that out further to other people who come to you with concerns about people dying and, you know, um, being injected with a bioweapon. I think that you don't take that very seriously, and it's unfortunate, but at least you're doing that for some, so it's better than not at all. Anyway, I wanted to tell people there's a worldwide freedom rally that's happening all over the world on, on Saturday the 19th. Um, and it will be at that building that they are in but at Waterfront Park, 1600 Pacific Highway from 10 to 2. And we'll also march around downtown, which is something that we do all the time to bring light to what's going on because people need it. And um, like I said, we had a candlelight vigil um, last Sunday for all of those who have died over the last two years. So um, whether it be from the mandates or the vaccines, I think it's important to rem remember all the people who have died and not discredit them and say, you know, some are more um, valid than others, but all the people. Thank you. Your time is up. We'll go to the next caller. My name is Truth. Credit to a speaker from our previous meeting for the idea. I apologize for not noting your name in time. In honor of Women's History Month, we, the people of San Diego County, would like to proclaim March 16th as Audra Morgan Day for her dedicated efforts in representing the noble ideas of freeing love, loving peoples at countless numbers of San Diego County Board of Supervisors meetings she has participated in. In her tireless efforts to show up and speak out, Ms. Morgan has provided knowledge, rallied morale, and even brought laugh to hearts as black as Nathan Fletcher's tends to be sometimes. Not every speech or comment she delivers may be gold, but they are delivered with the patriotic intent of standing up for the rights of all San Diegans. Ms. Morgan is the definition of San Diego's motto Semper Vigilans, which is Latin for always vigilant. May she continue to inspire others, especially women, to make their voices heard for the cause of maintaining freedom in San Diego County. To the national anthem. Congratulations, Audra. You've truly earned at least a day, as declared by this nobody. <laughs> also, special shout-outs to all the women who make their voices heard at so many of these meetings such as Ann, Amber, and so many others whose names I, I really don't know. Keep up the good fight. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Robert Gurman, I live in Lakeside. In December 2021, San Diego Regional Airport Authority received $24.2 million under the Build Back Better bipartisan law. In 2022, under the same law, there is $5 billion available for a new airport terminal. The grants will fund safety, which San Diego aviation industry definitely needs. 
sustainable and accessible airport terminals, airport rail access, and airport traffic control towers. We have a once in a generation opportunity to not just build new airport terminals, but build them in a way that brings opportunity to forgotten communities, increases competition, and reduces environmental impact, says Transportation Secretary Pete. This law was tailored for San Diego's need for a world airport at Miramar with multiple long, safe runways, convenient railroad access, sustainable, with sustainability into the future, surrounded by freeways on a plateau with increased accessibility in the middle of San Diego. These monies would increase competition by the availability of 26 thousand acres at Miramar for the future and reduce environmental impact by not fighting sea level rise while being on a plateau, which is a must for electric and alternative fuel aircraft. Lindbergh and Gillespie, because of their locations, will never see electric aircraft. I have attached a railroad accessibility map for those people who do not know that railroad tracks run, active railroad tracks, run within feet of Miramar's boundaries. As Pete, transportation, very Pete, said. Thank you. Your time one. is up. We'll go to the next caller. Diane Grace, parents and grandparents like me have become increasingly concerned that the interest of marijuana businesses are taking precedence over young people because we do not seek the ear of Board of Supervisors or staff. Our young people need protections that come from carefully considered thoughtful and enforced municipal code language that protects their safety and health now more than ever. In the interest of protecting the fair process as well as preventing any appearance of bias, the Board of Supervisors or their staff who receive or participate in ex parte communications with marijuana businesses and their allied businesses like attorneys and land use consultants should disclose them. So I ask that you look at changes to the county municipal code that increases marijuana businesses in the unincorporated areas, you will consider those changes through the lens of impartiality and make sure the interests of all citizens are protected, especially youth and young adults. We need the Board of Supervisors to really meet their goals of transparency and equal access when they consider public policy changes. Thank you. Thank you. And Chair Fletcher, that's going to conclude the request for non-agenda public communication this morning. For the remaining callers that requested to speak on matters not listed on the agenda, if you could please hang up and call back at the conclusion of the session. Next on our agenda is approval of the statement of proceedings minutes for the regular meeting on March 2nd, 2022. I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Motion by myself, second by Supervisor Anderson. Please vote. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present. Voting aye. We'll now proceed with the formation of the consent calendar. Members of the public will be able to comment uh, on items after supervisors had an opportunity to address the consent calendar and any items they wish pulled. Supervisor Anderson. No, Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Supervisor Desmond. Just a quick comment on uh, item two. I want to offer my thanks to all the good work that our Department of Public Works teams does in going after uh, federal and state grant dollars. In the past five years, uh, DPW secured over $3.7 million that went directly uh, to transportation and, and related improvements uh, throughout the county. 
Our local streets and roads uh, are being attended to, although uh, unfortunately not always as fast as our constituents would like, but uh, I know they are being worked on and I'm looking forward to see what can be accomplished in the next five years when we're going after these uh, grant dollars and hopefully uh, attaining our, our pavement condition index goal uh, in the near future. So thank you very much to the Department of Public Works. Thank you. Supervisor, uh, Vice Chair Vargas. Uh, thank you, Chair Fletcher. Um, I'm happy to second the motion. I just have a question on number two. And um, we, as it relates, and I, I think this is fantastic work that's been done, but I just wanted to find out um, how do we make sure, and maybe we don't have to answer it today, uh, but if we can follow up on this, how do we make sure that we, um, that the CBOs on the ground are able to apply for funding with the county? Uh, some of the times, uh, some of these grants require uh, opportunity or provide opportunities for CBOs to apply for funding. So what I want to make sure that we are doing is that the, the smaller CBOs that sometimes uh, are not in our, on our radar uh, understand that these opportunities are there and that are available for them so that they are, so are able to uh, be part of this process and, uh, and are able to get some of the resources and we are able to share the love uh, in terms of the funding that's available for our communities. Absolutely. We'll be happy to report back to you on that. All right. I have uh, no items to pull. Uh, we have a motion by Vice Chair Vargas, seconded by myself. Why don't we hear from our public speakers? Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We do have four total requests to speak, all requests coming uh, via phone. Any members of the public that have requested to speak on this item by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We will now hear from those that have requested to speak by phone. When it is your turn to speak, we, you will be unmuted and you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beat. I'd like to remind the callers that they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. Just waiting for them to be renamed so I know who. Here we are. And we'll begin with our first caller. Audra, I wanted to say thank you to Truth for saying that. That was really um, sweet. Anyway, um, Jim, it's a little weird when you say going after grant money. Like words are very um, powerful, and so that just sounds a little bit not good. Um, and I feel like with all of these policies that you want to bring in, people are going to fall behind as you advance the system because you're starting to advance it, but it's people aren't going to be able to catch up with like electric vehicles and you know not driving and you know having to walk everywhere which is what you want and for us to use public transit that isn't even available for most people in unincorporated areas and you want us to be in densely populated um, places um, and so the transportation stuff I feel like it's like you're trying to keep us from traveling I mean you could do more than you um, are with the gas um, like literally make it so that there's a cap or something because, um, it's, you know, this is a way to push us into the whole Agenda 2030 um, because, I mean, you don't even, you know, by the time we have electric vehicles, those don't even go that far. So it, just by default, people aren't even going to be able to really travel like they can right now. Um, but you're trying to make such drastic changes that there's no way that the people who are already struggling can keep up with them. And um, I think you need to think about that as you're implementing this. I mean, how many of you have electric vehicles? And you talk about, you know, wanting to use um, the sun and stuff. But yesterday in that building, the blinds were closed while it was still light out and you got the lights flaring. So it's like you're not even taking advantage of the sun in that building. Is that building going to be um, have solar panels on it? I mean, because quite a lot of electricity is generated in that place. Um, and, you know, I mean, are you guys going to be the first ones to get these vehicles and, you know, lead the way in that? Thank you. Your time is up. We'll go to the next caller. Yeah. 
uh, truth. No problem, Andre. On item one, most of this Board of Supervisors Traffic Advisory Committee recommendations have been all about making it more frustrating to drive in San Diego County by lowering speed limits, causing confusion, and adding congestion to commute. The reason for these changes is this Board of Supervisors decarbonization framework and Sandag's regional plan, both of which are against people owning cars and driving. This current proposal includes a recommendation for establishing three all-way stop intersections in San Diego country estates. All-way stop signs are currently being erected all over the country and have already created dangerous traffic problems. For example, in Traverse City, the all-way stop signs cause new bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic and blocked emergency vehicles from getting through. And in West Seattle, stop lights were removed and replaced with all-way stop signs, which encouraged many drivers to simply not stop at all, but instead roll through so children could no longer cross safely to school. Most motorists can't even figure out who has the right of way at these all-way stops. When a driver does stop for a moment, they often immediately go, which puts pedestrians at higher risk of injury. The reality is that traditional traffic lights and pedestrian signals work much better for safety purposes. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Hi, I believe I have the wrong agenda item. I would like to speak on agenda item number four. So with that, I will take a step. Uh, sir, this is the time to speak on agenda item four. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. I do have to then go in the other room because... Um, sir, could you begin by stating your name? Yes, Robert German, and I oppose agenda item four. The former uh, Board of Supervisors uh, changed the zoning at Gillespie Airport to aviation only, resulting in closure of El Cajon Speedway, motocross track, golf driving range. We were promised a park on Marshall Street in return for losing these public amenities. Every day, East County is looking more like Inland Empire. In 2017, the San Diego County Grand Jury identified severe problems in the city's aviation department. We have repeatedly asked for an investigation from the Board of Supervisors by the county grand jury because of the same issues at the county airport. Please uh, uh, look into this with public input and thank you for letting me speak. Thank you and Chair Fletcher that's going to conclude public comment on this item. All right, we have a motion by Vice Chair Vargas, seconded by myself, to approve the items on consent. Please vote. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present. Voting aye. Go to our first uh, agenda item, our only agenda item for today, agenda item five, an update, and uh, approve a contract related to the integrated regional decarbonization framework. I will turn it over to staff for presentation. Chair, thank you very much. We are trying to uh, upload the presentation with the laptops, if we could just have a few minutes. Thank <laughs> you. 
Take it away. Good morning, Chair Fletcher and members of the board. I'm Rebecca Appel with the Land Use and Environment Group, or Luge Executive Office. With me today is Mortiza Baxamusa, Program Manager for Regional Sustainability. Recognizing the need for a regional approach to addressing climate change, in January 2021, the Board of Supervisors voted to create a regional decarbonization framework. Today, we'll present our draft integrated regional decarbonization framework. To recap, here are the components of the framework. First, the technical report by UC San Diego and the University of San Diego that has been updated and being presented today. Second, a workforce development study by Inclusive Economics in which we're presenting a draft today. And third, the implementation pathways, which will be a collaborative approach and public and private stakeholders to co-develop policies, programs, and projects to implement the framework. These implementation pathways will be based on the data and findings of the two earlier components. Here is our timeline for which shows the concurrent work and development of the integrated framework with board actions, community engagement, and project details. Today we're presenting the draft integrated framework with the technical report and the preliminary workforce development study. The comment period for the draft integrated framework is through May 31st. During this time, we will continue to reach cities, regional agencies, tribal governments, business, labor, community, and environment groups across the region. Our public outreach plan will be organized into six categories to engage every community, public and private stakeholders, and meet them where they are to use their time wisely and provide them an experience that is tailored to their needs. First, we'll have communi regional community gatherings. These will be large public meetings occurring monthly with the intent to engage and educate the general public. Public workshops. These workshops are intended to provide stakeholders who want a more detailed dialogue with subject matter experts. Four of the workshops will be in April, one per week focusing on a key sector of energy, transportation, buildings, land and agriculture, and then another one will be in May focusing on jobs. Next, we'll have speaker series. These are intended to engage different types of audiences across the region. Guest speakers selected based on their national reputation will be encouraged to spark new ideas and explain old concepts in a different way so that we can all learn together. Direct, mark, direct engagement meetings and presentations. We are beginning to have regular meetings with cities and agencies along with individual presentations to elected bodies, tribal governments, as well as interested stakeholder groups. We'll also have pop-up community events. These will include various opportunities to educate the general audience on the integrated framework, what decarbonization is, and the county's role. And we'll have regional convenings for implementation. These will be events with public officials and stakeholders with a goal of informing the audience of the implementation pathways, and these will occur in summer and fall. We're excited to share that Luge is piloting a new engagement tool. With this new platform, the public is able to learn about the project, ask questions, as well as review and comment directly on the draft integrated framework. This platform will guide the comment process through May 31st. The framework's technical report is based on emerging best practices from across the nation and globally in the areas of buildings, transportation, electricity, and land use. These are our baseline assessments for our regional emissions. I will now turn it over to Dr. Gordon McCord from the University of California, San Diego School of Global Policy and Strategy. Good morning, Chair Fletcher, members of the board, and members of the public. It's my pleasure to update you all on the technical report for the San Diego Regional Decarbonization Framework. The RDF produces a pathways analysis of sectors in the regional energy system to reduce emissions to net zero by 2045 to align for state goals. The energy system is the total production and consumption of energy and electricity generation, on-road transportation, and buildings. Net zero here means that anthropogenic or human-caused carbon emissions equal anthropogenic carbon sequestration. The goal of net zero in this report is that the San Diego region fits within the state and national net zero pathways 
and not that this region achieves net zero in isolation. The RDF also analyzes land use, natural climate solutions, and quantitative analysis on job effects. The first comment period was open through December 3rd, 2021, and a new comment period is open now through May 31st, 2022. The UCSD team and chapter authors received comments from the technical working group, stakeholders, and members of the public, and addressed these comments as feasible in this revised draft. I will now briefly present some of the new analyses produced in response to these comments. This first map shows potential resources beyond utility scale solar and wind energy infrastructure, including wave energy, offshore wind, the full extent of rooftop solar, brownfield sites, and geothermal sites. Wave and offshore wind are not yet available in this region, but the map shows their physical potential extent. The second map shows a new scenario of regional investments in rooftop and infill solar alone. Solar infill refers to solar projects that are located in densely populated areas, with examples such as solar panels built on empty lots, built over outdoor parking areas, etc. This scenario does not meet regional energy demand, and it costs more than utility-scale renewable energy, but it minimizes land use change outside of urban areas. This next map shows a new scenario that meets 2050 energy demand using a mix of available resources, including utility-scale, rooftop, and infill solar, onshore wind, brownfield wind and solar, geothermal, and storage in batteries and pumped hydropower. It is more expensive than a scenario that uses only utility scale wind and solar, but it requires less land use change. The updated RDF technical analysis includes more robust discussions of co-benefits in each chapter to highlight the societal benefits in addition to decarbonization. These include environmental and health benefits. For example, there are health benefits from building electrification due to burning fewer fossil fuels indoors. To summarize, the RDF technical report provides quantitative technical pathways to decarbonization to inform policymaking, highlight trade-offs, uncertainties, decision points, and key takeaway policies and investments. Low regret actions are near-term actions common across pathways, worthwhile regardless of how longer-term uncertainties resolve themselves. Examples include building low-cost renewable energy sites, electrifying transport, reducing vehicle mile traveled, replacing end-of-life water and space heaters with electric alternatives, and protecting and natural and working lands to maintain natural carbon sequestration. This report models the entire region as a system to inform an institutional arrangement that promotes coordination and learning across jurisdictions while updating these science-based pathways as technologies and costs change over time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. McCord. We expect our region will see billions of dollars in climate investment over the next decade. These investments will fall mainly within energy demand and energy supply industries. Workers in these industries are in occupations that include everything from freight movers and bus drivers to a variety of construction trades. With these investments, we expect about 11,000 direct jobs in these industries. As a result, we expect 27,000 jobs which includes indirect jobs created by contractors that supply goods and services to these employers, as well as induced jobs created by employee spending in the region. Now there's a wide variety, wide range of wages for these occupations. And the numbers in this chart reflect the averages. Next, we looked at other job quality indicators. Some of these estimates are scaled from Southern California. Healthcare coverage is high in fossil fuel industry. Union membership is 18% in fossil fuel industry and 11.5% in clean renewables in industry. In terms of education, overall, there are more opportunities for those with a high school or less in most of these industries than in the overall workforce. 
there are also more opportunities for people of color. However, in terms of gender, there is a stark imbalance. For example, less than a fifth of workers in the clean renewables industry are women. Last July, the board directed staff to prepare a comprehensive green jobs plan that addresses the local policy opportunities available from climate investments as well as career pathways for our workforce directly impacted by decarbonization. As presented in November, we entered into a contract with Inclusive Economics to develop this plan. The draft report before you today is modeled after the state of California's Jobs and Climate Action Plan that provides recommendations on how to support a region's workforce as it transitions to decarbonization. I will now hand it off to the joint authors of this report, which is titled Putting San Diego County on the High Road, Dr. Carol Zabin and Bethany Jones, who are joining us virtually. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. It's an honor to be able to present our work today to the San Diego Board of Supervisors, and I'm, I will be presenting on behalf of my colleagues, Bethany Jones and Maggie Jones. So the purpose of the presentation is to answer two questions. One, what can we do to make sure that the jobs created by the decarbonization plan are good jobs and that there's pathways into these good jobs for workers from disadvantaged communities in the San Diego region? And secondly, what can we do to support workers who may lose their jobs uh, because uh, of weaning ourselves away from fossil fuels? And our bottom line conclusion is that with intentional policies and strategic capital investments, the decarbonization efforts can in fact protect and increase high quality jobs as well as pathways into them. Next slide. Well, what do we mean by high road jobs? And the state has now defined them to, to mean uh, family supporting uh, wages and benefits, health and safety on the jobs, career pathways, and all the, the basic protections, including the right to join a union. And job access means hiring good uh, local workers for good jobs and training and placing to support advancement. So high road employers are those employers who can who have a business model based on quality uh, and investing in their workforce and, and who can in fact support high road jobs and a high road policy framework is really one that allows those high road employers to to thrive uh, and uh, and therefore support good jobs next slide so I'm going to address two issues in ensuring good outcomes for workers in turn. The first is the strategies to support job quality and access for workers in the sectors that are sticking around or even growing. Um, and the second is to support transition for workers in the declining uh, sectors. Next slide. In terms of the growth side, why do we need to worry about job quality and job access? Unless we actually incorporate these goals and implement uh, actual policies into the overall climate policy, we're going to simply replicate, get what we've already got, and even exacerbate the deep-seated trends of wage inequality and wage disparities by race and gender. Our economy produces many, many low wage jobs. And that has been revealed even more dramatically with the pandemic. Um, so unless we are intentional, that will simply repeat itself. And we've learned a lot about uh, so-called green jobs in the last decade. Workers in green jobs are really in greening occupations. That is, an auto mechanic that works on an electric vehicle is still an auto mechanic and has to also know how to change the windshield wipers. It turns out that most of the jobs that contribute to reductions in greenhouse gas emissions are blue collar jobs. And many, many, many are construction jobs because a lot of this is about rebuilding our energy and buildings and uh, 
and transportation infrastructure. Not all are construction, but many. And these jobs aren't necessarily good jobs. Again, they follow the same trends as other jobs in the same occupation and industry. And they can be low wage, particularly if they're not public sector or unionized. Next slide. So the low wage trouble spots where we can uh, use policy to improve job quality. And this doesn't mean that all the jobs in these sectors are uh, are low wage, but we we have to look out for that. And and here is the the list of all the sectors where uh, attention should be paid. And this has been confirmed both by the state uh, research as well as the uh, Dr. Pollan's research for the RDF. Next slide. So what are these social policies? They're essentially policies uh, that put, put uh, job quality standards and job access agreements in any public uh, investment in decarbonization. In construction, you can plug into the high road through a variety of policies, but uh, the simplest one is a project labor agreement, which essentially uh, requires that the contractors involved uh, are participate in the state certified apprenticeship system. And San Diego has a very robust set of apprenticeship programs, both union and non-union. And that pulls in the contractors that really invest in their workforce. Um, in non-construction, there's a variety of policies too that aren't as well developed because there isn't the same type of really apprenticeship infrastructure, mm -hmm. but the same idea uh, holds in terms of identifying skill standards and wage and benefit standards um, that can be attached to the portfolio, each, each piece of the portfolio of decarbonization. Next slide. Training is important, but in itself is not sufficient. You have to create the demand for skilled workers in order for training to, to, to function as we hope to, to help workers adjust to new situations. Um, so that's why I emphasize uh, the previous um, slides about job quality and ensuring that we support those uh, employers that really invest in their workforce. Uh, but to address training, uh, we have also learned what works, and the state has uh, really supported what works with serious funding. Um, start with the jobs, partner with employers, um, and really support and enhance existing programs in the key workforce development institutions that train for careers. Apprenticeship, also higher ed, but again, because we're focused, we're because of the importance of blue collar uh, work in decarbonization, uh, which doesn't always require high, higher education, um, structures like apprenticeship are really key. We've also learned to avoid creating new niche green jobs training programs and really uh, fund, we should fund comprehensive training that prepares workers with broad uh, occupational uh, skills for careers. And the key state funding sources here are the high road training partnerships and the high road construction careers, which really are industry-based uh, training partnerships. Next slide. So I don't have time in this quick presentation to go through really the in the weeds policies that we have identified that correspond to each of the decarbonization policies in the RDF. As you know, the, D the RDF is based on um, looking at four sectors. And so what we did was go through each of those sectors and the policies identified and kind of added the jobs policies that are needed. So we did one for buildings, one for energy, uh, and um, let's move the slides along, Marvin. Um, 
for energy, the next slide uh, for transportation uh, electrification, another set of policies for transportation um, using looking at the lowering vehicle miles traveled strategies and the jobs policies for uh, land use. And uh, that is detailed in the report. I don't have time to go into the weeds here, but essentially what we're looking at is uh, the proper skill standards, the proper wage and benefit standards, and the proper mechanisms to use um, that can ensure good jobs and access into them. Next slide. So then we get to the, the hard issue of uh, the declining sectors and really how do we support um, workers who are at risk of job loss, which can be devastating for families and for communities. Um, and the goal of a truly just transition is to actually minimize or eliminate the need for safety net worker transition assistance. And uh, we think in San Diego, though, this is really possible. We can accomplish this by aligning capital investments with projects that utilize the same occupations as an industry uh, in decline. And this, of course, requires long-term um, planning and a lot of stakeholder engagement with labor, community, and businesses. But we really think this can be accomplished in San Diego because of the relative minor dependence of jobs on fossil fuels. We're really talking about gas workers. Um, and because of the really proactive approach that you all are taking uh, in, in addressing decarbonization. And finally, there's really a unique moment of federal investment in emerging climate um, technology. So what we're really talking about, next slide, is here modifying or expanding the RDF to include projects that may not pop up as the most, uh, uh, the, the, the least cost way to get to decarbonization, but are still economically viable and can contribute to climate mitigation and at the same time redeploy these fossil fuel workers. And so the four, the four we uh, identified are waste to energy uh, initiatives, district thermal energy, the developments that will be occurring in Lithium Valley, and on-site water reuse. This, all of these can redeploy uh, gas workers at the same comparable wages and benefits. Uh, and there really is uh, federal uh, funding and federal interest and state interest in all of these. Um, examples of planning ahead. Well, with district energy, it's really about strategically decommissioning and pruning the gas distribution system and at the same time converting to carbon-free district energy. Lots of interest um, by the US DOE on this one. And waste to energy, same way. This is um, specific technologies that it would take the, the uh, governments of the San Diego region to be proactive in uh, in making these efforts, but they are occurring in other parts of California and the nation, and there is support for that. Next slide. Now, it may be that, um, that not all workers can get redeployed. That is really the, the priority, and it would save money on the safety net uh, side. Um, because transition and safety net programs wouldn't be needed, but we do need to prepare uh, to support workers. And, and some of the considerations are bridges to retirement and pension guarantees, wage insurance for displaced workers like in Europe who, um, in, in case they get played, placed in lower wage jobs, and real retraining support uh, that isn't just, um, you know, a couple thousand dollars to for and leaving somebody to find on their own what training they, they want to do, um, but rather including career counseling stipends during training and uh, help with job placement. 
Next slide. So finally, what are the next steps for, for this green jobs decarbonization transition? Well, first, um, the local agencies who are implementing climate policy, and we've really seen this at the state level, really need technical assistance um, to identify and incorporate the labor standards and jobs policies recommended in this report. That isn't their area of expertise, and yet there are experts around the state um, and in your region that can help uh, identify uh, how to incorporate these uh, jobs issues. Um, we need to make sure that there is the pre-apprenticeship and industry training partnerships um, being developed to respond to these changes um, via, again, the ample state funding in this arena. And finally, really what we've seen around the state that seems to be working is to convene a just transition task force that includes affected stakeholders to really do deep research on the specific situation and needs of workers facing job loss. We can't get at this with government uh, uh, labor market data. Um, and then to identify these uh, climate and public investments that I spoke of and with that identification to develop the partnerships needed to apply for the state and federal funding opportunities in this moment of mm -hmm. a window of opportunity for these climate investments. And then be prepared with the safety net and a comprehensive approach to retraining if there are workers who cannot be redeployed and kept whole and who are interested in, in a position to change careers. And that's it. Thank you very much. We really appreciated the opportunity to work with you. Thank you, Dr. Zebin. I want to acknowledge Dr. Robert Pollan from University of Massachusetts Amherst is also on the phone to answer questions on the quantitative analysis on employment. On this slide that is in front of you today, we presented to you last July when we began this journey together. The next steps are towards implementation. Since we began this project, we have received board direction on incorporating social equity into looking into alternative renewable energy sources and ensuring robust regional collaboration. In our February update, the board also directed staff to engage with the farming and agricultural community to get their input on how we move towards more sustainable land use patterns to support local farmers. These have been the focus points of our framework and we will continue to update the board as we move towards public outreach and implementation. We are proposing that implementation will occur in two phases. The first phase would focus on short-term and mid-term implementation actions at the same time setting the table for long-term actions. The second phase would focus on long-term implementation actions by holding regional convenings, bringing together stakeholders and gathering feedback to refine the implementation pathways. These long-term actions would require cross-jurisdictional and a cross-sectoral approach and would need state or federal funding to implement at a scale or magnitude that no single entity can act on their own. This work before you today is possible through the partnership with leading experts and organizations that we have partnered with for our framework. The technical report was initiated with board authorization on January 27, 2021 to enter into a contract with UC San Diego. As we transition to implementation, we intend to extend this contract for three years with the authority provided by the board in its original action. This extension will allow us to explore innovative ideas that come up during implementation and continue our partnership with the university more broadly. Our second contract is with Inclusive Economics through which we were able to access the lead researcher at the UC Berkeley Labor Center. Our third contract is with MIG, which includes ongoing facilitation and outreach support. As we presented to you last month, USD's Energy Policy Initiative Center, or EPIC, look, looked at climate action plans, or CAPS, to identify the lo local policies and quantify their commitments through mid-century. It is important for us to continue to further develop and design the implementation of this framework. 
with consideration for what resources are required. Therefore, for continuity, we are seeking the board's approval for a contract not to exceed $400,000 for the implementation support from USD's EPIC Center. The, co the scope of this contract will, in will include regional work on climate action, estimated greenhouse gas impacts of these actions, and formulation of short-term, mid-term, and long-term implementation actions. The funding for this contract is within our existing Luge Executive Office budget. In August, we will be asking the board to consider adoption of the integrated regional decarbonization framework, which will include the two studies before you today, in addition, an implementation pathways report which will highlight options with regulatory poli interventions, policies, incentives that are within the authority of the county to adopt for short-term implementation actions and to direct for further legal and fiscal review for mid-term actions. To recap, today's action is to receive the draft integrated regional decarbonization framework. This includes a technical report that was updated by UC San Diego and the preliminary workforce development study led by Inclusive Economics. We are also recommending the board approve the contract with USD's Energy Policy Initiatives Center to support implementation design and development. As we continue our public outreach, we look forward to engage the community and stakeholders and looking to co-create solutions. This concludes staff presentations, and we are available for com questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you all for the, uh, for the presentation and the work. I want to commend uh, Vice Chair Vargas and Supervisor Lawson Reamer for initiating this effort, and I think we're, we're seeing good, uh, good progress. Obviously, we all have a, a, a motivation around the noble goal of trying to do our part to save the planet in decarbonization, but in the process of saving the planet, we can't destroy the middle class. Um, and we have both environmental justice issues and economic justice issues. And I think one thing that really strikes in this report, there tends to be a defensive notion around thinking around, okay, we have to ensure that a good union job in fossil fuels becomes a good union job in clean energy. But I think what I take away from this is the reality that it needs to be a much more proactive approach to say we're going to create exponentially more net jobs. And when we're talking about building the foundation of our economy here, those are jobs that can't be out, out, outsourced or offshored. Those are jobs that will be created here, and so how do we create good jobs in those, ensuring both a, a transition to the extent it happens, plus the creation of new jobs can be net-net uh, win for our, our planet and, and for the middle class and working class. So certainly a, a lot of work ahead, but I think there's some encouraging things here. Um, let's go to our public speakers, and then when we come back, we'll go to Supervisor Lawson Reamer, Supervisor Vargas, who brought this forward, and then my other colleagues uh, for their thoughts or comments. But let's, let's hear from our public speakers first. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We do have 22 total requests to speak, all those coming by phone. I'd also like to note for the record that we did receive 37 e-comments e on this item, 33 in favor, and one was neutral. Any members of the public that have requested to speak on this item by phone, if you could please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We will hear from those that have requested to speak by phone. When it is your turn to speak, you will be unmuted and you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. I'd also like to remind the callers they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. And we will begin with our first caller. My name is Yusef Miller. I'm with the Clean Earth for Kids and the North County NAACP Environmental Justice Committee. And I would like to thank the county staff, Board of Supervisor Tara Lawson-Reamer, Nora Vargas, and Nathan Fletcher for your work on this uh, San Diego Regional Decarbonization Plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And, and this approach, this science-based approach to pathways to reduce carbon emissions in transportation, electrification of buildings, and land use throughout San Diego region, which is on indigenous lands. This will lead to less uh, air pollution, water pollution, and land pollution for better health for all. I would like to take this time also to comment on the use of the N-word yesterday at the Board of Supervisors meeting. The African-American community receives insult after insult. Our family and friends watch this channel, and we should never have to hear racial epithets at a, at a public forum. But back to uh, the um, the topic at hand, please prioritize building elect electrification 
retrofitting of rooftop solar and reduce carbon emissions and pollution. This is healthy for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. We will go to our next caller. Hello, my name is Stephen Gelb, and I'm with San Diego 350. I'm grateful for the supervisor's force of commissioning the RDF. I think the RDF is a terrific step forward for our region. It spells out the urgency of the moment and the need for bold collective action to avert disaster. One of the startling points it makes is that even if all the governments in the region met their current climate commitments, we will fall far short of our goal in reducing climate heating gases. That is, we will be stepping off the cliff together. So we must heed the RDF's call for large investments and rapid change, and in the RDF's terms, for a paradigm shift in our local economy. We have limited time to address the urgency of climate change. The San Diego region can amplify the impact of its decarbonization work by serving as a model for regions across the country. This framework could, could position San Diego as a global leader in climate plan. The time to decarbonize is now. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Honorable Chair and Supervisors, my name is Dr. Angie Neeson, and I am with the Public Health Advisory Council for Climate Action Campaign. I am here today in support of the recommendations made by the Climate Workforce Report. I am also part of the minority of physicians representing the mere 2% of Latina physicians across the country. So today, I'm speaking on behalf of my patients, my community, who are always underrepresented when public health decisions are made. My patients often don't realize that their health is only as healthy as their environment, such as access to healthy foods, clean air, affordable housing, walkable and bikeable communities. Throughout my years in practice, I've realized much of my patients' health is dependent on decisions that make the healthy choice the easy choice. And as climate access widens the health disparities for our marginalized community, I can only see this gap widening. However, this workforce report makes the healthy choice the easy choice. And as a healthcare worker, many times it was really difficult to see the inequities with the pandemic. So I hope we see this as an opportunity to place equity and environmental justices at the center of this vote. As a preventative physician, I tell my patients I'm not the Band-Aid approach doctor. Let's get to the root cause to maximize healing. So when I see a well-done, evidence-based, critical roadmap that provides specific policy tools to support our region through decarbonization in a way that preserves job quality, broadens access jobs for members from historically marginalized communities, my response is yes. Let's follow the science and start healing the planet for our children. They will inherit it. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Hello, I am Dr. Kristen Hanscher with the San Diego Green New Deal Alliance and the Public Health Advisory Council. I have been a family physician practicing in San Diego for 21 years, and I am calling today to voice my support for any and all policies which facilitate our successful regional decarbonization efforts. In the last year, I have diagnosed three non-smoking patients with lung cancer. They are all relatively young, athletic, and previously healthy individuals with healthy lifestyles who came in with vague coughing symptoms. Two have kids living at home, one is a colleague that I work with. They are now on therapy, two, two of them are now on therapy, which costs about $12,000 a month to extend their lives, but it will not cure them. The third will be starting this therapy soon. Why am I sharing this with you today? Because this is not normal. Three lung cancer diagnoses in one year in young non-smokers is an unprecedented frequency in my 21 years of experience. It stands out as representative of a growing threat. We know that climate change is harming our health. We know that air pollution is linked to an increased risk of cancers, including but not limited to lung cancer. 
Lung cancer is the number one cancer killer in both men and women in the U.S., and we are all being exposed to the carcinogenic particulate matter in the air that we are all breathing. Our country, our state, and our county cannot afford to keep burning fossil fuels. The human toll is tragic. The financial toll with rising health care costs related to climate change is simply catastrophic. I respectfully ask the Board of Supervisors to support the health and well-being of our community by supporting successful decarbonization strategies. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Good morning. My name is Christina Marquez, speaking on behalf of our 3,600 electricians, power professionals, and working families in San Diego and Imperial counties. Our union has been a longtime proponent of a clean energy, green future, locally and statewide. We strongly support reaching zero carbon emissions by 2035, if doing so is intertwined with the creation of good middle-class jobs and labor principles inclusive of prevailing wages electrical state certification requirements, and employment of a skilled and trained local workforce using policy mechanisms to enforce these. The workforce is very strong on these values and more. As said in the report, we want to emphasize that we need to make sure that all the new and existing renewable energy jobs are high road, high wage jobs with clear pathways to state approved apprenticeships for training and equal opportunities for the communities of concern. This would help to put the families of the San Diego region on an upward path to a better quality of life. Implementing actionable policies is the key to achieving this in an equitable manner. Again, this is a great report and we thank the staff for their excellent work. Let's keep working together to lower GHG in our beloved county of San Diego and uplift the working families to build our green future. Thank you. Thank you. We will go to our next caller. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Dee Mitter Miller with San Diego 350. Thank you so much to the staff and the multiple organizations who've been working on the RDF and its workforce study. I'm pleased to see the direction that the regular updates are taking and the emphasis on collaborating country countywide. Thank you for the extensive public outreach too. Thank you also for the explanation of how high road jobs will work to reduce the inequities in the job market, the supportive project labor agreements and investment in the workforce. I have two concerns. First, in the final draft, there needs to be built-in enforcement language to hold officials and others accountable. Secondly, on the transportation front, with the expected use of flexible fleets in areas that lack public transportation, I question the idea of using transportation network companies known as Uber and Lyft. These companies actively oppose the recent proposition that would have supported their workers. Their businesses also purposely reduced transit ridership and created more greenhouse gas emissions in the process. The climate crisis is bearing down on us. Let's get this done together. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will go to our next caller. Good morning, Chair Fletcher and members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is Rosa Redrick, and I am a project manager at Jay Whalen Associates. Jim Whalen sends his regrets, but he is in the field where he would have testified himself. As a member of the generation who will be living with the real-world effects of climate change, I support the efforts of the Board to decarbonize San Diego County and would like to read Jim's comments into the record. First, county staff and consultants deserve a great deal of credit for their outreach efforts which have ensured that all viewpoints on this very complex subject get heard. Second, 
I think it is apparent that we have a ways to go in reaching zero carbon. The updated RDS acknowledges that our region will need to access solar resources in Imperial County and Mexico to achieve 100% clean energy by 2050. Third, the updated RDF also makes it apparent in the local policy opportunity section that a great deal more needs to be added in the transportation sector. What that means in practice is more electric cars, way more. Development patterns are not going to change appreciably, and the only way to correct the imbalance between the GHG inventory and actual measures to reduce GHG dramatically is increasing the decarbonization of transportation, even if it takes legislation to get proper credit for doing that. Finally, I pledge to work with staff to assist the county in developing implementation pathways, including realistic partnering opportunities with the private sector that can be scalable. In particular, the idea of developing local carbon offset programs is particularly as attractive. We will provide more comments as the board gets closer to a vote. Thank you. Thank you. We will go to our next caller. Good morning, Honorable Supervisors. My name is Maxi Blasini. I'm co-manager and a steering committee member of the San Diego Green New Deal Alliance. I want to thank the board and staff for your leadership on advancing just policy recommendations in our path towards a decarbonized region. I'm calling today to urge the board to continue to foster regional collaboration to stop the climate emergency while protecting and expanding the creation of good family-sustaining union jobs and advancing social justice. The Climate Workforce Report offers a vital roadmap that provides specific policy strategies to support workers as our region goes through decarbonization in a way that secures and expands the creation of an access to high road jobs. It represents a step forward in the right direction towards recognizing and addressing the concerns of workers and working class communities as it relates to our collective transition towards a safe, livable and prosperous future for all. I urge the board to support recommendations for the development of robust programs that maximize redeployment opportunities, minimizes worker displacement and relocation, and also fosters the creation of high road jobs within communities of concern. We must do our best to avoid abrupt disruptions and ensure the continuity of workers' employment and economic security, and to expand good quality union job opportunities for communities of concern. We want to elevate that a just transition program must also include one, opportunities for the creation of pipeline jobs within historically marginalized communities, and two, the identification of economic diversification opportunities and local microgrid, microgrid and rooftop project developments that can offer an avenue for both the redeployment of workers as well as the creation of new high road jobs. Additionally, as the report highlights, there is a need to expand good union job opportunities within the lands and public agency sectors by developing training programs for wetlands restoration and other activities that increase the carbon sink of natural lands. We hope the board will continue to support AB 1640 and co-establish a regional climate network at Sandag in order to facilitate the implementation of RDF. Thank you. Your time region. is up. We'll go to our next caller. Hi, uh, this is Bob Poland from uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I'm the co-author of the paper on job creation that would be generated uh, by the project. Um, I'm really here uh, just to answer questions. Um, you've, you've seen the report, you've seen what we've come up with. I'll just make a couple of very general statements, uh, which is number one, uh, we've given you the job estimates resulting from the project focused on the years uh, uh, through 2030. And as, as you could see from the, our estimates, we come up with about 27,000 jobs per year that would be created within the county uh, that would otherwise not result. In other words, we're ratcheting up the level of employment by about 27,000 jobs. That is equal to about 1.5% of the overall workforce. We also estimate that through 2030, there would effectively be no uh, job displacement. That is, workers who would get laid off um, and would need another job. And there's two reasons for that. Number one, 
that the uh, the extent to which the fossil fuel sectors in San Diego County are going to be contracted uh, is relatively modest through 2030. Uh, coal is, contracts 100 percent, but that's a very small sector in your county. Um, the petroleum sector contracts by only 20 percent in the model, and uh, natural gas remains stable. Uh, in addition to that, we look at the demographics of the employment in the region in these sectors, and we find that, roughly speaking, the number of people who are likely to uh, voluntarily retire uh, between now and 2030 is uh, going to be approximately equal to the number of layoffs that are going to result in the oil sector and in the coal sectors. So we have an opportunity to create about 27,000 jobs and effectively very few uh, dis job displacements. Thank you very much. Uh, we will go to our next caller. Audra, you guys are just trying to ruin people's lives even more by doing this because you're going to have so many jobs lost. And what if somebody doesn't want to work in this new way of life that you guys are trying to create for the people? Like you want to be the beacon of everything. And so you have to take advantage of new funding, support ways, uh, what works with serious funding, federal investments ample funding. It's like you guys just love money. It's disgusting. And you don't care how this is going to affect people. Um, you know, the fact that you're going to be taking jobs but claiming to give them jobs when they have to train. I mean, they're going to have to be probably vaccinated, too, is another thing. But, I mean, the demands, the rooftop solar and infill solar don't even meet the demand. It costs more. So it's not like you guys are doing stuff that is, like, more... Um, feasible or like easily accessible you're making life a lot harder on people and you're taking land and filling it with solar so why don't you take and like make sanctuaries where like you don't build upon this that you can plant trees and have like an abundance of um you know uh living things there so that they can you know recycle the carbon I mean, it's like you want to go into all these other ways that actually are not helpful, that are more, you know, destructive to the environment, like lithium valley. What the frick is that? I mean, you guys know that lithium batteries are completely toxic. So I don't understand. It's like you're going to create all these things so that in what, in another 50 years, we have to figure out how to reverse all the stuff that you guys did. I mean, that's where we're headed. And you don't really take into consideration what people think. It's kind of like what, Nathan, oh, just don't live here if you don't want to go with our new way of living. I mean, no one said that they wanted this. Like, you didn't come to us and we're like, hey, do you want this? It's just like, this is what we're going to do. And we're going to get Thank all. Thank you. Your time is up. We will go to our next caller. Truth. The San Diego 350 Minions are partnered with the U.N. Association, Democratic Socialists, and more. I bet San Diegans can't wait to see an empty lot full of infill solar panels outside their ugly $600,000-plus stack-and-pack windows. It's nice to hear admission about how jobs, and especially for women, will disappear under this United Nations Agenda 21 drive plan. Here's the decarb framework document entitled San Diego as a model, written by Alina Creek from the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Quote, this county project team is working closely with the UN SDSN towards the achievement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals in the United States. End quote. The UN is the overseer of this plan that is found all over the world, for example, in communist Vietnam. It fits perfectly with county staff's old concepts and new ways line. For those that still don't know about this decarbonization framework plan, please watch the supervisors meeting from November 17th, 2021. Your eyes will open wide. There are offensive ideas, such as having renewable energy developed in Imperial County or Mexico for cheap labor costs, stealing geothermal energy from Imperial County, stealing lithium from the Salton Sea, 
having an unelected conference of government to share all info and decide San Diego's fate. On this United Nations-directed decarbonization framework path, San Diego County will rely solely on one of the dirtiest, most expensive forms of energy, electricity. That would truly overextend the grid and make San Diego County experience reoccurring outages just like in poor countries. It will also put San Diego residents' lives under the boot of an unelected body called the Conference of Governments. Thank you. Your time is up. We will go to our next caller. Hello, my name is Suzanne Hume. I'm the educational director and founder of CleanEarthForKids.org. To be clear, this plan is about saving lives, cleaning our air, and protecting our future. Thank you to county staff, Supervisors Lawson Reamer and Verkus for your important work. Please accelerate the timeline. We cannot wait. We must address the climate emergency, reduce fossil fuels, and greenhouse emissions, including natural gas, which is just methane gas. We must save the lives of our children, protect the air they breathe and the water they drink, and work for environmental justice and equity in a livable future. CalPERG October 2021 named San Diego as having the worst air in the entire country. Soot and smog come from the burning of fossil fuels. Thank you to the county for divesting from fossil fuels. We need building electrification, retrofitting, rooftop solar, training and education programs for green jobs, and to help farmers and gardeners and the public go, go organic and stop the use of toxic synthetic pesticides. Most synthetic pesticides are made of fossil fuels and toxic chemicals that get into our water and our air and on our land and food, poison our people and wildlife and the pollinators in which we depend for our food. Please purchase and protect additional open space and work to restore wetlands and marshes to absorb carbon and filter our air and water. Protect these natural marking lands. Stop the pesticide use. Invest in neighborhoods for all children. They need to all have access to healthy green spaces, not synthetic turf or plastic grass. We must invest in them for their, for their health and their future. Also, stop false solutions. Stop CCS. Carbon capture is a false solution. Say no to hydrogen. Only promote green hydrogen projects. Stop natural gas, methane gas. Stop biogas and warning and burning. No burning to no burning if it's waste to energy. And of course, do not promote nuclear energy. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Robert German for Citizens Against Gillespie's Expansion Low-Flying Aircraft. I am requesting that the San Diego Aviation Complex be included in the discussion, in this discussion. There are clear pathways to reducing aviation emissions involving proven land use with using safe union craftsmen. If we don't include aviation in this framework, then I ask the board to remove the voting privileges from the San Diego County Regional Airport Authority. They should have no standing. I recommend giving the voting privileges to the San Diego Port Commission. The Port Commission, uh, let's see, the Port has done a great job. The Airport Authority has shown no such ambition. I have included an attachment which shows airplanes with leaded avgas residue on their fuselage that fly every day over our homes burning leaded avgas and a picture of the leaded avgas being washed from the plains into our stormwater system. If you do not feel compelled to include aviation in a pathway, then I feel this decarbonation framework is not credible. Please look at my attachment and the pictures on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller.
Good morning. First, I'd like to thank the board for hearing public opinions this morning on this important issue of regional decarbonization to fight the climate crisis. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Barrera Servest with the San Diego Green New Deal Alliance and the Public Health Advisory Council for Climate Action Campaign, and I support Agenda Item 5. The Climate Workforce Report will aid in addressing the concerns of working class communities as we make our collective transition toward a safe, livable, prosperous future for all. When I was working in the emergency department last summer, I had a young patient who had a seizure for the first time on an exceptionally hot summer day, which we're seeing many more of now due to the climate crisis. And he wondered what was going to happen to him, what would happen to his family if he lost his livelihood. He was rightfully scared, but equally worried about the medical bill that he was going to have to foot. He seized because his body overheated. He was dehydrated in the beating sun. The climate crisis disproportionately affects the poor and communities of color. Um, and more and more, we're going to see the negative health effects that it reaps on blue collar workers like my patients and on the poor and elderly who, for example, can't afford to run the AC in the summer. Unfortunately, we are, we're seeing a disproportionate amount of climate-related health complications and deaths in these populations. And as a physician, I see it firsthand in a heartbreaking way. A recent EPA report found that with two degrees Celsius of global warming, black and African-American individuals are 40% more likely to currently live in areas with the highest projected increases in extreme temperature-related deaths and 34% more likely to currently live in areas with the highest projected increases in childhood asthma. Hispanic and Latino individuals are 43% more likely to currently live in areas with the highest projected reductions in labor hours due to extreme temperatures. Both you and I, being trusted messengers, owe it to these communities to include them on the path forward to move toward climate equity and social justice for all. I urge the board to please support recommendations in the Climate Workforce Report. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Good morning. My name is Lauren Ostrowski. I'm a medical student at UCSD and a supporter of the Green New Deal Alliance, working with the Public Health Advisory Council for Climate Action Campaign. As a medical student, I work in community health, and I see a lot of patients hit hard by the effects of climate change. I see patients experiencing homelessness living in heat islands downtown who come in over and over again with heat exhaustion and dehydration. And I have patients with lung disease made unbearable by air pollution. I have one patient with chronic asthma who lives in an industrial area, and the air pollution from fossil fuel burning factories around her aggravates her asthma, so she's even waking up at night to cough. She's from a more rural part of California, and when it gets hot and dry there, the dust kicks up and gets in her lungs. It makes it hard for her to go see her friends and family because she knows she'll be struggling to breathe. She's terrified of fires in California, and we know she's depressed because she's not sleeping well, she's coughing all the time, and she can't easily go see her family and friends. As her providers, it's really sad for us because we really don't know what to do. We've tried every drug available, and none of them work well enough, so we see her suffering over and over again. As a medical student, I'm still early on in my medical training, and I have to imagine what the world will be like in the decades to come when I'll be practicing. And I have to think that if I'm seeing patients like this now suffering from climate-related health issues that we can't treat with all the medications we have, how much worse can it get in the decades and decades to come? The climate crisis is a health emergency, and to cure it, we need decarbonization. I want to thank you for allowing me to speak today and encourage you to support AD 1640 and better collaboration throughout the region for climate action. Thank you. We will go to our next caller. Good morning, Honorable Chairman Fletcher and members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is Dallin Young. I'm a SDG&E Public Affairs Manager speaking on behalf of my 4,500 colleagues. Uh, first, I'd like to thank staff for their continued work on the RDF and its additions. At SDG&E, we recognize that the need to address climate change and its impacts. We share the county's ambitions in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and improving our air quality and want to be a partner to the county as we proceed down the path towards decarbonization. SDG &E adopted a company-wide sustainability strategy focusing on the areas of environmental stewardship, clean transportation, grid modernization, community engagement, and company operations. All of this with a commitment to achieving net zero GHG emissions by 2045. That pledge not only includes our own direct emissions, but those generated by customers. 
Additionally, we are excited to announce the release of our economic or economy-wide GHG study in the coming weeks that will include pathways to get us to net zero emissions with electrification and new technologies like hydrogen. We hope that with both our study and the county's RDF, the San Diego region can continue to successfully transition to a decarbonized future. We are proud of our ongoing partnership with the county, meeting the Meeting the ambitious goals outlined in the RDF and sdg &E sustainability strategy will require continuing our, coll our collaboration. We are still internally reviewing the, F the RDF revisions and workforce study, and we will be providing more feedback on the plan before the comment deadline. In the meantime, we stand by ready to assist the county in shaping our clean energy future. Thank you. Thank you. And Chair Fletcher, that's going to conclude public comment on this item. Thank you. To, uh, to all the callers, we'll go first to Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Well, thank you so much. First of all, thank you to all of our uh, callers who've called in and called in today and called in um, before, and I think we'll continue calling and engaging in this process. And I think um, the public interest and support for momentum um, on our regional decarbonization and green jobs plan is evident, uh, not only in the callers today, but also uh, in the comments and the participation um, over the last many months um, as this report has come together. Uh, so I also just really want to thank UCSD and GPS um, and EPIC and Inclusive economy, Economics. Uh, I think we're just so fortunate um, here in San Diego to have this global level of expertise to help us figure out what to do here in our own region, um, to have some of our nation's leading experts on jobs and uh, protecting and building and creating good, uh, good jobs for working families um, throughout California, uh, focusing their lens on how to, how to do that work here in San Diego. Um, and as well as uh, experts at UCSD who've been working with countries around the world um, to figure out what to do as we look to uh, build a green, clean climate future, um, and instead to be able to focus that lens and the expertise right here in our own region. So thank you so much. Um, thank you as well to our staff and uh, Mertesa and Sarah and everyone who's been working so hard on this. Um, I know it continues to be a, a mammoth undertaking as evidenced in the 700 pages uh, produced so far, um, and I'm sure there will be many, many more pages produced um, by the time we get to August when I know that the plan is to come back in August with uh, some proposals for what we as a county, um, using our county powers, um, you know, both uh, sort of in terms of our operations as well as the uh, scope of authority we have in our unincorporated areas to implement um, policies here at the county that we can pull the lever um, you know, in our own jurisdiction uh, to move forward with our regional decarbonization and green jobs work. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to that coming back in August. I think that will be um, a really important moment um, in all of this work. Uh, all that being said, I, I do want, I have a lot of questions and I also want to just sort of highlight a few things that jumped out at me. Um, one of the things I thought, felt was, uh, thought was really helpful, um, you know, looking at the the no regret strategies, right? The things that we know we need to do um, in the near term um, that ha that are that that um, set us up on a path, um, you know, that's going to be more sustainable moving forward. And I just wanted to uh, pat ourselves on the back for ha having already taken one of those steps. I think one of the things that jumped out at me was um, to try to encourage uh, building in low VMT areas um, as well as near transit. Uh, and that's something that we did begin moving forward. Um, I think it was last month. So I think we're, we're beginning to take these steps already, and I think that was important to highlight um, that, that the work we're doing um, and already doing feeds into some of the recommendations in this report, and specifically on the land use uh, and the land use planning, and we're already beginning to move in that direction and looking forward to continuing to move away from um, high vehicle miles traveled and uh, high carbon emissions towards low vehicle miles traveled and low carbon emissions. So I think that's um, really uh, promising and heartening. Uh, that being said, let me jump to some of my questions. Um, apologize if they're uh, not that, um, I'm sure they're going to be very basic for the authors of our reports. So thank you. So apologies in advance. Um, the first one is for Gordon, sorry, for Dr. McCord. Um, I'm looking at this, uh, this geospatial new findings and additional analysis on uh, the scenarios regarding energy production. So it says, um, the rooftop solar and infill only 
which would meet 35 um, percent of our regional energy demand, uh, would be an average levelized, levelized cost of energy of 70 uh, megawatts. Um, the, the regional utility scale solar and wind, which would meet 100 percent of demand, but would, you know, have pretty significantly adverse uh, externalities in our uh, in terms of land use and um, land use planning and, and those considerations is at 40. But then the new scenario, which is the mid range, which says it's going to balance the competing pr priorities, the average is actually more than either of the other two. So I was trying to better understand why are we not halfway in between? Why are we not like somewhere in between 70 and 40? Why are we at 109? Yes, thank you. The reason is that the $70 with the rooftop and infill solar only gets us 35% of demand. So the mid-range scenario gets 100%. You're producing much, much more energy, which means you're moving up that marginal cost curve for these other sources. But so that, that, that makes sense, but the, the regional utility scale does meet 100% of demand, and that's at the 40.65. So why wouldn't you just like get to 35% of demand with at the 70 megawatts per hour and then do the other 65% of demand at the 40 megawatts per hour. You See what could, I'm saying? Yeah, like, you, you, you could, but the land footprint would be large. So we're avoiding, the mid-range scenario is avoiding the, what you're describing would have a large footprint. We could run that scenario, but it will have a significantly larger land footprint than what you're seeing in the mid-range scenario. Got it. Okay. I, I'm going to, I want to follow that up because yeah. I think that's actually really helpful and that feels like um, something that I, that I, I don't know if, Marissa, is it, is this something we could get answered as sort of part of the board process or should I just take this offline to but get an answer? Supervisor Lawson Raymond through the chair, um, we'll follow up with you. I think what the answer is gearing towards is in terms of greenfill versus infill and the relative cost difference between those two. Okay, that's super helpful. So thank you. I'll definitely want to follow that one up. Okay, my next question um, is um, for our team at Inclusive Economics. Are they still on? Yeah, great. Um, so I have a few questions. I think this just report was so fantastic and incredibly helpful, and I think was really promising and really hopeful, and I'm just very excited that we have so much we can do in San Diego County. Um, so just looking, just some very sort of specific questions. So looking at the job policies for buildings, um, so there's a sort of recommendations on small co commercial and residential building decarbonization, which I thought were really helpful in terms of using pre-qualified contractors um, and pre-qualifying -pre responsible contractors uh, for that decarbonization. Um, I was just wondering then looking at the distributed solar and storage the job policies for energy, which was supporting models of distributed solar that are community scale ra rather than individual homeowners roofs uh, so that you could have contracting models support high road jobs. I guess my question is why could we not take a similar strategy for uh, rooftop solar production um, that you would take for residential building decarbonization in terms of, um, you know, uh, incentives around uh, responsible contracting and um, investments funds for uh, rooftop solar that would have the same kind of um, uh, job protections to create high road jobs in the energy uh, production sector as in the building, res commercial and residential building decarbonization sector. I, I don't know if my question's clear. Apologies if I know it was a little long. Um, I think so if I'm understanding uh, you correctly. Uh, there's a couple reasons. One is, you know, it, it, it's just simply when a market is already established in roo rooftop solar, it's it's very hard to kind of change the whole market. It's a very atomized market where uh, individual homeowners contract with uh, with individual contractors. And there's a lot of competition, very high marketing costs, by the way. Um, and so it's harder to, to change that current market. It's also, as the last speaker just pointed out, uh, you know, rooftop solar on an individual homeowner's home is just much more expensive. So compared to either utility scale or the in-between community scale, which is what we are suggesting should be really 
explored a lot more. Um, and so it's harder to support better jobs. So I, this is really important and interesting to me because I also sit on San Diego Community Power and we're really at this point now figuring out, you know, what do we do? How do we get more renewable? How do we incentivize right. good jobs? Um, so I'm just going to take advantage of the sort of great fortune to be able to speak with you on this issue. Um, so I think a couple questions. So when you talk about, I guess my uh, two questions in that, two follow-up questions. So, you know, if you were, why wouldn't you, couldn't you just do something like, okay, you tell you tell all these utility customers, like, here's your pre-qualified list. You do sort of a pre-qualified, then you're reducing the marketing costs for like the five companies that pre-qualify. So they have an incentive to pre-qualify because then they get mailed to all the individual customers with a phone number and an email. So then they don't have to like go market. They reduce their marketing costs. Then they get, I mean, it just seems like you could be that market maker. If you're a utility provider, you could be that market maker, um, but only for the, only for the, entities that are pre-qualified and like, you know, actually meet the sort of job uh, qualifications and job standards that we actually want to promote um, and also provide incentives for rooftop solar installation, but only if you use these, uh, the companies that actually meet our job, like our job qualification and job level standards. So that, I think that was my question, like I, of, of could, how, yeah, no, you're you're right. It is possible if the utilities uh, really controlled that market yeah. and became the seller. Um, it is possible. You might get a big drop off in demand because I do think it would be um, more expensive because people wouldn't be competing on the basis of of lower wages. And again, the megawatts produced on an one individual rooftop. There's much more design issues. There's yeah, you can cut down maybe on the marketing uh, costs, but doing it on commercial buildings at a bigger scale on all the public, um, you know, public buildings, public parking lots, that kind of thing um, lowers the cost per megawatt. And therefore, there's more room um, to support uh, a, a better, better uh, compensated workforce. I, that makes perfect sense. I mean, certainly it seems just very much more practically easy to say, let's get all the school buildings and all the county buildings and all the city buildings. You have a lot fewer actors to have to coordinate. So your coordination challenge is a lot lower and a lot bigger uh, construction projects. And um, so clearly, like, I see why that uh, community uh, scale would be both uh, lower in terms of cost of megawatts and also much uh, easier to implement good labor standards. So I, I definitely see that, but I'm sort of interested in a both and, you know, thinking right. sort of both and, and specifically since we do control the utility, um, you know, we're like over 20% of the vote share as a county on San Diego Community Power, um, which, is, you know, we do control the utility. So sort of thinking about how do we leverage that utility being the utility. Um, to kind of like become a market maker, reduce transaction costs for rooftop solar, um, and 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 potentially make that also po also possible. Not or. I think it's not an or. I think it very clearly the community scale makes more. It seems easier for all the reasons that you outlined. Um, yes, that makes sense. Um, but thank you. No, this is just so helpful. And then I also had another question. Um, actually, we'll comment and then a question. I just actually. I really appreciated uh, the frame of, you know, saying starting with the jobs so and creating demand, right? You, you know, I think you said, how can San Diego implement best practices for training, for retraining uh, um, our workforce? And I think really leaning into, uh, we need to have jobs, right? We can't just retrain folks. Um, we have to make the market. And so there's a role for us as government to play in like creating demand for those good, for those jobs so that there is a reason for there to be a training pipeline because there's there's going to be jobs at the other end. Um, and I think that's just, um, you, you know, an important thing that we need to keep in mind that we can't just do training. We actually have to have sets of sort of standards and expectations on our side as the consumer um, of energy um, and as the sort of, as we sort of set local industrial policy to, to create that demand so that there are um, jobs um, and reasons for people to go through that training. So I just I just wanted to highlight that. I thought that was great. And then I had some, a question around waste to energy. I'm just very curious. Um, I wanted to hear a little bit more about 
how you sp spoke specifically about how waste to energy um, would be a place where individuals who had been employed in the gas sector could uh, find find jobs without having to sort of change careers or career classifications. Just full disclaimer: when I was in fourth grade, I. Uh, my uh, invention convention experiment, I was um, to, to put balloons on the, um, the rear ends of the cows to try to capture the methane uh, coming from the cows. So I was very interested in this uh, challenge of how do we convert waste coming from the cows to energy. <laughs> Where did I get a cow? Uh, we do live, there are some folks in East County with cows. We can talk to Joel about his district. Um, but anyway, so I've been long interested in this like challenge of how do we convert waste uh, to uh, energy that we can use to actually like run our run our economy, but um, so I'm just really interested. So what does that look like? Like what are these jobs? And just wanted to hear a little bit more about about the job uh, strategy in the waste to energy sector. Um, right. Yeah. Well, we we didn't really look at um, dairy methane. I I appreciate and uh, um, your description of of your. Um, Past that was really lovely. Um, what <laughs> what folks are talking about um, <laughs> is more uh, big landfill uh, waste to energy biomethane projects or green hydrogen demonstrations, um, and uh, and also industrial process heat. So um, this does use the skills of really the the, the pipe fitters are the key. Uh, occupation here. Um, you know, these are really highly trained through five-year apprenticeship programs, and uh, they understand gas, and they understand the movement of water, and so they may have to upgrade skills through a, an additional module on a specific technology, but they have the whole um, broad occupational training and skills and knowledge to move very, very quickly um, into these jobs. Unfortunately, my colleague, Bethany Jones, uh, who now works for DOE, actually understands the technology better and so could address your specific questions about how the conversion happens, which I unfortunately did not do science experiments like that when I was a kid and didn't follow up either, but I, I leaned on um, my colleague, Bethany, for that piece of the report. I'm sure she'd be happy to talk to you more about it. That, yeah, Marissa, maybe we can follow that up. That would be great. I, I just think that's really promising. And it seems like, again, that this, there would be a lot of co-benefits um, on this piece. So just- Right, and, and it's happening. It's happening, for example, in Lancaster, not too far from you guys. And it's happening all over the country and there's very, you know, again, I'm saying there, there's a big window of opportunity with the uh, infrastructure bill, the federal funds, and the work of DOE to really push these technologies that, you know, can work particularly for, um, you know, hard to electrify end uses such, such as industrial process heat and that kind of thing. Great, thank you. Now I have another question. I'm not actually sure who to address it to. I think, Murdisa, you're the person who was talking about uh, um, sustainable agriculture and climate um, strategies. I um, would love to hear a little bit. It was just touched on in a briefly. I'd just a little, love to hear a little bit more about the work that you are thinking that we are going to be doing in that category. So, thank you, Supervisor Lawson Raymond, through the chair. The county of the county's board of supervisors has, through the last year, with the framework of the future and the continuation of direction provided a variety of enterprise-wide policy measures. What we want to do is, our goal is to ensure that all these efforts are integrated into the implementation pathways report that we bring to you in August. So um, we're reaching out to the agricultural community. We're making sure that we go in and hear what they have to say in terms of input and with all the other measures that are in motion, we're intending to bring it back to you in August. That's, I mean, as I think everyone knows, I'm very interested in like procurement and how we use our power as procurement uh, as a county, which um, is pretty significant. 
um, to be a market maker um, around um, the agricultural sector locally, um, especially because we do, you know, procure 20,000 meals a day here in the county. Um, you know, so we've talked about this before, and I just want to take it. I just wanted to build on what you said. It would be. I would love to see, sort of, thoughts on how uh, we use our procurement, um, our procurement policies to catalyze and drive forward um, a, a, clean inner, a cleaner or climate, more climate friendly ag sector locally um, because we're such a big purchaser and could you know, potentially shift the demand, um, the, what the demand that, that the ag sector is looking at by using our large purchasing power to sort of shift expectations. So um, I think those are, I actually have lots more questions but I know everyone else does and I've talked a lot and I really appreciate this. Uh, just extremely exciting work. Um, so I think the I think the only other things I think are more operational for our county our county team is um, do we do we have a, a plan um, on on how we socialize this and, and like regionalize this, right? Because we have a plan. Obviously, we're going to come back in August with a bunch of policy proposals that we can implement, but. A lot of these ideas are things that, and I'm, I clearly have a plan for how to get San Diego Community Power to do some implementing, but that's only two agencies, and like, there's lots of agencies, right? We have cities and jurisdictions and SANDAC and Caltrans, there's like lots of stuff going on. So do we have a plan for how to sort of shop around the findings here and um, like work with San Diego Workforce Partnership, all of the cities um, to kind of take a lot of these recommendations and make a plan around them? Uh, through the chair, Supervisor Lawson, remember, yes, we do. And uh, we had this slide earlier, and I believe Rebecca spoke to it, as far as the outreach, uh, the different facets, the different approaches, having in-person meetings, having virtual meetings, weekends, evenings, work weeks, whatever works for those stakeholders who we're working with. And um, ultimately, at the end of the day, it is going to be about the partnership and collaboration. So this will only be as successful as the momentum that we build and the partnerships that we grow in this process. So uh, the team has already begun those conversations and meetings. The public comment period time is open on the entire framework and all of the reports until May 31st. Our team will be as accessible to all the stakeholders as possible for us to make sure that we're, as Rebecca mentioned, going to them uh, and having those conversations. Do you have like a priority list of entities you're going to go meet with, sort of tech we on top? We do. Tech we tech. have the stakeholder list, and we'll be happy to share that with your office. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, sure. Just a couple comments as you come back in August. I think. Clearly, 100% um, renewable default in uh, seems like we should be doing that here at the county. We should be at 100% renewable. I know we have a direct access program in terms of how we procure our own energy. That's pretty amazing. So I think we should obviously, like in August, go to 100% renewable. Uh, to, to Carol's point on um, sort of rooftop solar, community level, um, seems like we got a lot of county buildings. Maybe going to the community level rooftop solar in our own buildings might be a uh, an obvious step forward that incorporates and can model some of these labor standards. I think those are two comments on um, energy production. Um, and then I just wanted to, I think, clarify, I think our intention has always been to, you know, really take the high road workforce analysis and the regional decarbonization framework as an integrated package. Um, do you need any additional instruction from the board to, to integrate these? or Because if so, I'm happy to make that as a motion or add that to the motion. Supervisor Lawson Reamer, at this juncture, we are solely asking for the board to receive the report. And then once we've gone through the public comment period and evaluated that, we will come back with some options for consideration and then additional direction we would recommend be provided to us at that juncture. Okay, great. Well, then I am happy to make a motion to uh, adopt the recommendations in this item and just very impressed and really excited. So thank you to everyone. Thank you. Vice Chair Vargas. Thank you. Um, all right. So um, let me just first start off by saying that we had a really great workshop um, this past week, um, both Supervisor Lawson Weimer and myself uh, around this particular issue. And I think that's the kind of work that we need to continue having. So I really appreciate county staff and all the work that you've been doing around this um, in addition to the report and all the work 
really making sure that we are doing everything possible to uh, uh, engage the community in this process. And like I tell folks uh, on my team is that we have to make sure that we are doing everything possible uh, so that folks really understand what decarbonization means and what it means to regular folks on the ground and how we, how we, um, we speak about it in our communities. And so I think, um, you know, uh, for our region to move forward towards clean energy and technology and innovation, we also need to be thinking about, um, you know, and, and, and it was mentioned here, how we future proof our jobs and provide opportunities for skill training and how we build resilient industries, right? And uh, I really appreciated uh, a lot of the information that you all provided. I think um, we have really have an opportunity to collaborate and to ensure underserved uh, communities are prioritized as we transition into these decarbonized green jobs. Um, and we wanna make sure that they're good paying jobs. And for me, I think it's, we have, we're, I think we're in a pivotal point as a county to really think strategically about how we position ourselves to develop policies um, that in the end are gonna have long-term economic uh, opportunities. And, and I think that as we're looking at our Office of Economic um, and Climate Justice, our Office of Economic, um, um, Economic, uh, these long titles of all of our positions, right? Economic, uh, economic and community development. Um, as we're looking at um, all of the different offices that we've created, they are all going to be integrated into this work. And so, um, I think the research that is being done, integrating into into it, and then because so many of us serve on so many boards and commissions as supervisors representing our communities, I think we have a great opportunity to br bring this forth. Um, and, and really make this and prioritize it. And so for me, good paying green jobs are an essential component of sustainability. And so it's really important that we're building the talent, that we're recruiting for the jobs of the future and as a pathway to begin building wealth in our communities. I really um, want to make sure that we think about increasing public and private investments in climate, climate related jobs uh, as we're looking and I really keep focusing on our underserved communities because I think uh, I want us to think about what the, these jobs of the future look like. Um, I understand that we think a lot about the transition piece right now, but I also want us to make sure and I want us to challenge um, the economic sectors out there and also really think about how do we um, work with our uh, and collaborate with workforce development providers, apprenticeship programs our community colleges, and I also want us to think about um, challenging our school boards and our governing boards, right? Not just our administrators, but the folks that are the policy makers to think about what are they doing? What are they doing to train their teachers? What are they doing to train their school boards? Um, I mean, the school boards are doing to train and, and to bring additional resources to do some of this work um, so that they are thinking about um, what our kids need to be learning for the jobs of the future as well. And, um, and they're able to compete uh, for, for those jobs as well. And so then, in addition to that, I think, you know, uh, really thinking and wearing my hat uh, from CARB and APCD and SANDAC to ensure that we're bringing additional dollars to the region for additional funding um, so that our communities are able to, to really um, thrive. Um, so I think that I just wanted to say again, thank you for all the great work. Um, I was really thrilled to see that we can create nearly 27,000 jobs um, in the San Diego, San Diego region. I think if anything with COVID, we know that our communities have been hit hard. I am going to be taking a deeper dive into particularly the issue around the gender parity issue. For me, I think it's really, really important. I mean, this is Women's History Month, right? I mean, Women's Month. And uh, for me, it's really important that we really think about what that looks like um, as we're developing these new jobs. And so with that, I just want to say thank you again uh, to everyone, and I'm happy to second the motion. Appreciate it. Thank you. Supervisor Anderson. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciated the uh, report. Uh, I had just a few questions. We touched upon waste to energy, and I know that in the years to come shortly here, some of our landfills are going to be uh, <coughs> coming to their capacity. Uh, as we move forward in phase one, uh, can, uh, are we gonna, is, I don't know enough about the technology, but is it possible to start uh, a biomass facility or anaer uh, anaerobic digestion now while they're still operating, or do you have to wait till they fully close, or how does, how does that work? 
Okay, now I'm not sure who's best to answer it. I can just say quickly that we can get back to you on more of the details, but just as a matter of scale, waste emissions are around 2% of the problem. So we've focused on getting the, that's why we focus on the energy sector and waste to energy is a bit of an afterthought in terms of modeling getting down to zero because it really is only 2% of the problem. And current waste to energy or biomass in general produces about 2.9% of energy in the state of California. And so that's why it's not, it's not been a priority for us so far, but we can get back to you with more technical details. Yeah, uh, we're still gonna have a methane issue. We're still gonna have, and so when you think in terms of quality of life, when you think in terms of who lives closest to the dumps, uh, there's an equ equity aspect to it as well. Uh, and then, uh, did we, did you look at, you know, I think about all the basic needs of the community and water being one of them and the cost of water in, in energy. Did you look uh, at that very deeply or think in terms of that? No. no. Uh, I know that when we looked at desal, uh, they like to partner it with power plants because of the demand of electricity that it requires in order to use desal. And I know that there's new technologies out there. In fact, uh, Berkeley is leading the charge on harvesting water from the air. And because the uniqueness of our location, uh, I'd like in phase one to go back and look at that because I know that the cost of water is so, so expensive in terms of it. But, uh, there's researchers at Cal Berkeley, and I believe the researcher's name is Omar Yagi, Yagi, Y-A-G-H-I. And this is new technology. They go in the middle of deserts, and they're able to harvest uh, water out of the air. And I just would like to take a look at that framework to see if that, uh, whether that would be applicable to us and whether that would be helpful. And I'd like to do that in phase one. And then we didn't really touch on it, uh, uh, in great depth in the presentation, but in thinking in terms of carbon sinks and trees in their planting, I know that we have had a lot of wire fires and I, and I know that Parks and uh, Luge have, have worked really hard at making strides with this, but we have federal money perhaps available to work with the Cleveland National Forest and some of the other forests to, to do some planting. And, you know, one, to reforest that area would, would not only help our environment, but it would also uh, ensure that we wouldn't have mudslides if we, ha if we have torrential rains, which it's been a long time. And the other, since we have, and then the other part is, uh, you know, this is a strategic partnership in how many people we could get back to work uh, in that investment. And then I didn't hear or see anything on this, but there's new technologies out there on direct carbon capture. And uh, crazy as it sounds, Texas is leading the charge on that. And uh, I think that we should be competitive with Texas. Uh, and, and while there's not a lot of companies that are doing it, uh, their carbon capture that they're building in, Cal in uh, Texas is the equivalent of 40 million trees that they're able to capture, recycle, and use. And so, in this first phase, I like to go back and, and take a look at that technology and, uh, uh, and perhaps invite some of the companies that are developing this technology to see how they, they can help us with it. And then uh, finally, uh, you know, when we're thinking in terms of uh, synthetic fuels, green hydrogen production, uh, other sustainable fuels that can be developed, uh, clean fuel solutions. I know it was touched on briefly, but uh, looking at air to fuel technology, that's another emergency technology. You know, I think back when uh, President Kennedy challenged us uh, in the space program to get to the moon. Here we have an opportunity on the ground floor to look at the shape of how we're going in looking forward towards new technologies and, and how revolutionary. And one of the things I loved about the report is the, look at the, the, the thought of not changing land use so much that we don't even recognize our own communities and addressing this in a meaningful way. And I'm thinking that on some of these technologies, while 
they're new uh, and they're still being scaled up, we should take this into consideration because we're talking about a plan that's not going to be completed this year but completed over the, the, the near future and we should be on that cutting edge and we should be doing everything we can to get the highest and best product for our communities. And these are technologies too that when we look at them, we're going to think, hey, we're really happy 30 years ago we invested in this and look, we have access to more water than we've ever had before. We've got better, greener energy than we've ever had before and our quality of life is at the best it could be. So uh, I'd like to include those five topics as a, uh, as a uh, friendly amendment to include in phase one. And I can review it with you if you like, uh, but I, I don't know, uh, Sarah, if you and your team got, you know. Thank you, Supervisor Anderson. We don't need an amendment. We will make sure that those are incorporated similar to the comments that Supervisor Lawson and the Vice Chair have made. We're just gonna incorporate all the feedback and then ensure that we follow up with you as far as the timing of being able to report back on those. Excellent, well, I'm very pleased. <laughs> Supervisor Desmond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, staff, and everyone for the uh, for the update. Um, you know, I want you to know I'm all in favor of cleaning up our carbon emissions. My mother taught me to clean up my messes, and we've certainly, as we polluted the air and water, we need to uh, go make sure that we uh, clean up. But we have to make sure that while we're on this decarbonization effort, that we have to do it in a fair, equitable, and, and balanced way. And as we go down this path uh, to decarbonize San Diego County, we must also consider our housing shortage and also our struggling far farmers who produce the food we eat, and they also produce the carbon sequ sequestering crops and, and plants. But speaking of, fair of fairness and balance, I'm deeply concerned about with the Workforce Development Studies plan, Study Plan that requires PLAs and union labor for all commercial building decarbonization pro uh, projects and utility scale renewable projects and the transit infrastructure uh, expansion pro projects. I think our focus in San Diego County should be that we, we uh, have, have local hires and apprenticeships and pathways for the disadvantaged. We also have fair wages and standards for all. You know, the term equity is actually used quite a bit uh, here in the, in the hallways of this building and yet we get a report on how PLAs and unions will be a requirement for contracts on the largest construction projects as part of the framework. And I think requiring PLAs is, is a totally separate issue from reducing carbon emissions. But here it is in the recommendations. And when it comes to equity, uh, the PLAs to me are the antithesis of equity in that if you're not in our club or our organization or our union, you can't work on these publicly funded projects. And this August, if the framework uh, still comes back with the language requiring PLAs, we'll be voting on, on that item that could effectively discriminate against workers not belonging to a union. So now, and I'm not anti-union. I was in a union for 33 plus years. Um, but I'm against discrimination. And all workers, I think, should be treated equitably and fairly and all have the same fair shot at these high paying jobs and at the training and, and apprenticeships. And people still have a right to join a union. If they want to join a union, fine, but you should not be discriminated against or not be allowed to work on particular jobs if you're not part of a union. So today's item is simply to receive the update. Um, but I'm dis disappointed that at this stage, in preparation of the framework, that we're open to the idea of discriminating against anyone. I think it actually taints the uh, de uh, decarbonization effort by putting in discriminatory practices. I believe everyone should have a fair chance and be able to participate in the decarbonization jobs, and I'm not going to be supporting a requirement for PLAs. And as I conclude, I want to make sure that the public's aware that there's a public comment period on this framework that we're just that we're approving today. We're receiving the report through May 31st of this year, and I would encourage anyone who is, you know, alarmed or, or doesn't agree with these discriminatory recommendations to get engaged in the process and express our concerns. Concerns, and I believe and I want to achieve all of these decarbonization goals. I think they're good goals. I think it's high time we do it. 
we, and I'm particularly in the transportation sector, particularly with uh, electric vehicles and putting the infrastructure in our roadway system to uh, adapt to these new high-tech high uh, vehicles and hopefully autonomous cars someday. But I think there should be equity, in, equity, I'm sorry, equity in jobs simply should be implemented equally to both union and non-union San Diego County workers. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just note for the record that California law and public construction code 2500 specifically prohibits discriminations in PLAs and specifically permits all qualified contractors and subcontractors to bid without regard to if the collective bargaining agreement exists. So just what, what the law is. Well, With that, we've if, got a motion could, by Supervisor Wasserman. If Wasser I could follow up on that since sure. you commented on that, it, it's to bid. But the, all of their work to bid. So companies can bid on these jobs. All companies can bid. But they can only have maybe a handful of their management. But their workers, the, the workers on the jobs, all have to be unionized. They so don't. to bid is, is they true. They don't. They don't. You don't understand state law. It's fine. We can do a class on PLAs one day, too. We'll do a public workshop on PLAs. We've got a motion by Supervisor Lawson Reamer, seconded by Vice Chair Vargas. Please vote. Chair Fletcher. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. We will now reserve return to non-agendized public communication. I'll ask the court to call forward any remaining speakers. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We do have five uh, requests still to speak on matters not listed on the agenda. These are all by phone. Uh, would ask that the uh, members of the public please call into the conference line now with the instructions that were provided to you. We will, we'll, we will now hear from those that requested to speak by phone. When it is your turn to speak, you will be unmuted and you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. But also like to remind the callers that they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. And we will begin with our first caller. And again, if you could please state your name before your comments. Hi, yes, uh, my name's Chana. Um, a few things. I was in the audience yesterday regarding the behavioral health workers dressed in purple shirts from the SEIU union. I, too, am in a unionized job. It's very common for there to be many accommodations that unionized workers get that private sector employees would be aghast to hear about. I'm wondering if these accommodations are affecting the efficiency, the efficiency of the sheriff's department. This may this may also be part of the problem in regards to what the state auditor was talking about. It's disgusting to watch unionized employees barely doing the minimum, not hustling in their jobs. You guys were just talking about a little about this. This has been exacerbated the last two years. Some are genuinely lazy. For example, public school teachers wouldn't work with kids in person until one year ago in this county, but planned and met for happy hours that fall and winter 2020-2021 in this county. Maybe the solution is to start hiring at-will employees and have both. Then maybe work ethic would be in, would, would increase. Um, number two, gas prices. 20 day, 28 days in a row, it has increased here. Average gas price now is $5.77. We are paying 50-something cents per gallon just for the cap-and-trade tax, another 51 cents per gallon for the state excise tax. Then there's the sales tax. The sole purpose of these gas taxes is to ensure road quality. You all casually talk about equity. How is it that upper class areas have nice roads, but working class industrial areas have potholes all over and requests are ignored? You should all be on the phone hammering the state politicians, your buddies, in Sacramento every day. If you are not, you are ineffective. Fletcher's tweet yesterday about supporting the governor's gas debate proposal is meaningless. It will not be equitable if it's done that way. Equitable would be seeing a 50 cent drop on the gas station price score. Three, why is it so hard to even get the basics done in the county? We pay a ton of taxes to live here, and you won't see to it that the basics are done on our streets, highways, and yet you spend time and money on all. Thank you. Your time is up. We will hear from our next caller. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. My name is Carol Green and I'm proud to be the president of the California State CCA. Yesterday, I uh, joined the Board of Supervisors and told you about California State CCA supporting AB 1690, which will ban the sale of tobacco filters, single-use cigar, nicotine, and cannabis electronic vapes. 
uh, California State QTA, and I personally applaud you for your um, earlier position on uh, banning flavored tobacco. I want to share with you a little bit about the process that goes into the PTA making these decisions because it doesn't happen lightly. California State PTA can only take a position on a policy if we have authority, meaning that we have to have passed a resolution by our members at our annual convention or a policy statement adopted by the board of managers with representatives across the state. Resolutions and policy statements need to be fact-checked against credible primary sources, and we need at least two primary sources in order to take a position on any issue. Therefore, this is not just my opinion, but this is scientifically um, gone through with a very um, credible group of volunteers. I just want to share one item with you. Cigarette filters are the most pervasive form of litter worldwide. Of the 6 trillion globally consumed cigarettes, approximately 4.5 trillion cigarette filters are littered into the environment each year. Our coastal ecosystem, San Diego, face significant peril from cigarette and vape waste. Improperly disposed cigarette filters and single-use vapes keep toxic chemicals into the environment, pollute water, and harm wildlife. The United Nations and the World Health Organization noted that within 60, within 96 hours, just one tobacco filter could kill 50% of the saltwater and freshwater fish exposed to its toxins. California State PTA supports AB 1690. I hope the Board of Supervisors will as well because it will improve our environment, the health and safety of our children. And I hope that the Board of Supervisors will also consider these items as they pass other um, policies that affect the children of San Diego County. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Good morning. This is Kelly McCormick. I'm a public health educator. I'm here to share a new report by UCLA, USC, and the University of Arizona, commissioned by the California Department of Cannabis Control. On the topic of marijuana regulations, the report states, quote, there are indications that cannabis use and frequent use are becoming more prevalent. So state policymakers and local jurisdictions need to take evidence-based steps to prevent problem cannabis use. In particular, lessons from alcohol and tobacco regulation can be adapted into policies that protect public health in the age of cannabis legalization. Still quoting, some of these measures may include requiring health warnings on cannabis products, informing vulnerable groups about the risks of cannabis use, limiting cannabis marketing and product diversification, and taking steps to avoid the emergence of profit-driven cannabis markets that are likely to promote use, end quote. If the Board of Supervisors allows an expansion of the pot industry throughout the county, problems associated with the use of high THC marijuana products will grow, specifically mental health problems for young people. We can help our communities immensely by focusing more on preventing drug use than on catering to the marijuana industry, which is purely profit-driven, and doing everything possible to get more people using marijuana more often. You have pushed back against big tobacco, hooking kids on flavored e-cigarettes. Now it's time to push back against big marijuana. Thank you. Thank you. And Chair Fletcher, that's going to conclude the request for non-agenda public communication this morning. All right. Thank you all for joining us today. That concludes the business before the uh, board. We will stand adjourned. The next regular meeting of the board will take place on April 5th, 2022.